Is Catherine Crick a frustrated actress? We have some video clips we'll be showing you today that we are going to talk about her work in love because we're praying for her and we're praying for her followers. And I'm joined today by my good friend, sister in Christ, Dawn Hill of Love Six Scribe, who is a former prophetess herself. And Dawn, you call yourself a former false prophetess, correct? Yes, ma'am. I sure do, because I falsely prophesied in this movement, even though I was sincere, uh, there were things I said that did not come to pass. And if I am going to abide by the biblical standard, then um, I, I would fall under the category of a false prophet in that movement. But you specifically have a star, like how Jesus had a star. In the spiritual realm, you have a star. Once again, as I shared about what the star of Jesus is, it's the same, it's that same principle of the star in you attracts others. It opens up doors, supernatural doors in the spiritual realm. It, it makes favor to be upon you. It makes yeses to come to you for God's purposes, for his will to be done. Elevation to come for his will to be done and for him to get the glory. Amen. You have a star in you. So you just saw Catherine Crick claim that, and I can barely say this because it's so blasphemous, but claiming that because Jesus had a star, and I'm assuming she's meaning the star of Bethlehem that the Magi used from prophesy to find the baby Jesus. That So therefore, we all have a star within us that allows God to give us blessings. And yes, can you comment on that based on your past experience? Yeah, so listening to, to her say those things, uh, I heard a lot of very self-exalting, uh, but there's always this sleight of hand. That's probably the best way that I can can describe it. Uh, there's this sleight of hand in there that says, oh, well, it's all for the glory of God. But if you really pay attention to what she's saying, you'll hear a lot of this um, central focus on you or self. And then uh, God's at the periphery is how I've described this before within this movement is that you're the center, God's the, at the periphery, and he's watching, and he's cheering you on. Um, and, and though they will give lip service to God, the roles have changed to where you are now being exalted. And essentially, you're being worshipped. And for her to say to these people these types of things, she's really pointing them to themselves and their sufficiency within themselves and what God wants to do to, to exalt them. And you heard her say exalt to get you in these places, to, to have you do all these great things for his glory. But is it, is it really glorifying him or is it glorifying her or glorifying others around? I think this really, in my opinion, it promotes self idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, it's really promoting that self-exaltation of man, which is very sinful. Um, it's Luciferian in nature, um, very prideful, arrogant, and uh, very prominent in, in this movement. And I can, sadly, I can attest to that. I mean, again, I was sincere in my motives um, at times, but there was a lot of self-exaltation. Self a lot of pride and arrogance. And I see this, uh, unfortunately, when watching a lot of her videos and this one in particular. Well, it's interesting you bring that up, Don, because in this next clip, Catherine is going to say that those of us who insist that teachings be aligned with the Bible have a religious spirit. But God wants to bring more. God wants to bring meat. God wants to bring mysteries. God wants to bring secrets of the kingdom. That comes by taking the limits off of him and allowing him to expand upon scripture, bring revelation upon scripture that aligns with scripture. Religious spirit doesn't like that. Be aware of that. <laughs> they always will say, but it's not in the word of God. What, what she's saying, though, uh, is very Gnostic in nature because she's appealing to mysteries and Scripture has already revealed uh, the mysteries, even when Paul, as you know, when, when you read and he talks about the mystery of God, he's talking about the gospel and the Gentiles coming in to the kingdom of God. So she's, she's undercutting the word is what she's doing. I mean, she's saying, oh, yeah, you can read the Bible, but you, you, need, to, you need more 
than that. You need to understand the secrets and the mysteries. It's almost as if the Bible is just not sufficient to tell us what we need um, for godly living and to know God. And um, I don't know if she'll see this video, but I am going to, I would just personally like to say this to Catherine is that um, you need, you need to realize that scripture is sufficient and scripture tells you just like has told us um, the proper authority of what God has established. And you're disobeying that by, by what you're doing, first of all, and then you're undermining scripture and you're saying that your revelation is on par with scripture because God does, he never speaks unauthoritatively. Um, and so that's the, that's the scary thing. And, and I've heard her minister these things of listening to her teachings. When she says the word, she's not only saying the Bible, she's saying God's ministering the word to you today. She believes that what she says is God speaking. Um, it, yeah, I, it, it's, it's, just, it's very alarming. The, the more I watch of a lot of people, but her in particular, the more I watch of, of her teachings and things, the more concerned and grieved I become because it's, it, it's going in a bad direction very fast. And if she was doing sound biblical teaching and you know, we would say, hey, we have a past too. We understand. But it kind of speaks to maybe her motivations for what she's doing because she is running a church and traveling and from the pulpit teaching men, which is in violation of 1 Timothy 2.12. But not only that, she, what she's teaching seems to be her own kind of man-made philosophy that she's come up with. And we know from 2 Peter 1.21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So when you want to be an actress, you create what's called a reel. It's a, an audition tape, if you will, of your acting uh, abilities. So this is a picture of Catherine Crick's um, Vimeo page, which is public. And uh, I'm going to have her phone number blacked out here and her email address blacked out here. But uh, you can see it says Catherine Crick Reel and a picture of her looking very Baywatch, I might say. And then here's the actual video uh, of her audition tape. You'll have to excuse her. She's as dumb as a doorknob. <laughs> what do you drink? I don't know. I've never had alcohol before. <laughs> that sounds awful. Here you go. Cheers to new beginnings. <coughs> oh my. <coughs> Goes on smooth, doesn't it? <coughs> so Jonas, do you do you have a girlfriend back home? Oh, I had a fiance. Um, does that count? And you decide to move in with a porn star. Our parents wanted us to get married, and and I couldn't go through with it. So I just felt like my whole life was, was being planned out for me. So I came here to start fresh. Well, you definitely came to the right place. And my bar is the perfect place to start. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of discrepancies between her acting career versus what she's doing now. Uh, just right. observing her, that, that, that seems very theatrical and dramatic and it it doesn't i mean i don't want to be rude but it, it just doesn't come off as sincere it 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 doesn't seem authentic it seems very fabricated and and theatrical yeah okay that's the word theatrical well here's uh her next uh, uh clip in her actress audition tape her reel uh shows her playing the part of someone who's got who's been scammed and who doesn't know she's been scammed. So that's kind of interesting foreshadowing too. This guy in Craigslist, he's told me that if I gave him $1,200, that he'd hold an apartment for me in Beverly Hills. Beverly Hills. Wow. I know. And it would cover the first one's rent, deposit, and a parking spot. And that's crazy. Can you believe it? Isn't that amazing? It's such a good job. Wow. I could be living in Beverly Hills. <laughs> but so 
the only thing is that I have not been able to get a hold of him. Like, he's not picking up his phone. And I don't know what's going on. Um, but like, the last time I talked to him on the phone, he sounded really nice, so... That was obviously a homemade video with really poor sound quality. Um, but the, nonetheless, this is her s pretending to be someone who got scammed by some bogus ad to get a Beverly Hills apartment for 1200 bucks. And then the guy disappears and she seems surprised. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I go to the fact of I've seen some of these things and comparing them to how she presents herself in in front of her congregation that she has or when she's at conferences and things i don't see any any difference in her mannerisms and uh it, it does seem like that it's garnering more of an audience and again this theatrical uh, yeah. approach I, I just don't see any any difference in that and so then it kind of makes me wonder is this is this all a performance for her because she's getting that attention that she wants and she's getting the notoriety and, and things that it sounds like she wanted as an actress. And, and we all have dealt with, with wanting attention and wanting to be, um, to be accepted or to have a platform. There's a part of us that wants that. And it's a very prideful way to be. So I don't want it to isolate her and say, Oh, she's the only one that deals with this. Cause we've all dealt with that at one point or another. So, I mean, if you were to put the two together of her ministering and one of these, how could you tell when she's being genuine and when she's acting? Yeah. And I think that's, that's a good question to ask. It is. And I, again, uh, I agree with you that if she would address it, it would be very helpful. So one of the uh, reality shows that Cat Crick was on was the second episode of the first season of this reality show called Love at First Kiss. And the premise is that two strangers are put in a room and they kiss, and based on whether they like that or not, they go on a speed date at, in the studio that's also filmed, and then based on that, they go off on, in the real world and have dates. So Cat Crick went on to this show. You can see uh, here's the guy that she's set up with, and he says that he, that he only dates model types, um, kind of a, a rough bad boy character. And here's Kat saying that she hopes this is the guy that God has in mind for her. In this video, she says she's a Christian. She said she's been saving herself for a marriage. Uh, kind of sends a double message. What do you think? I would agree. And I was even, even the fact that she was on there um, and, and looking and then just from based on a kiss that she said, oh, I felt like this was who God had for me. That's not using wisdom. Um, and it's not even using the biblical approach of basing a physical interaction, of, an, a physical intimate interaction on who your husband is going to be or who your wife's going to be. Uh, it, it just, it, it was not good wisdom on her part. And so, you know, I don't know at that point if she truly was a believer or if she's just very immature and didn't have good guidance. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it definitely does not, again, it does not paint her in a, a good light. And, and, and it can be, I mean, it can be really easy to look at those and it's kind of funny, but this actually, I had some compassion for her because when she was sitting there kind of tearing up and, um, feeling sad that this wasn't the one God had for her and she didn't understand, I felt compassion at the same time. I thought, well, again, you're putting yourself in a situation that this is not a good situation. This is not how you, you find someone that you're supposed to be with. And so uh, we can get hurt in putting ourselves in, in very unwise and in compromising situations. And um, I, I, just, I would pray that she would be willing to, to receive biblical correction um, from people that really uh, care about her and care about the people that she's influencing because it's a serious matter. And so, you know, just like with this, I think that Equally so, she she could have made better choices in this situation. Well yeah, yeah, absolutely well said. So it it does just appear, and this is our opinion. You know, only God knows Cat's heart. But in this next clip, uh, where Cat is celebrating, um, she's she's turned thirty three years old, so she's quite young. Uh, this year, as we're filming this in twenty twenty four, she was born on January first. 
um, and she's got her congregation, I almost want to put that in air quotes, at her 5F and then church, I'm going to put that in her five-fold church. Uh, she's got them lined up uh, to give her birthday gifts and accolades and praise and then bow down at her feet. And then she puts her hands on the head of each person and blesses them. <clears throat> in fact, with one of them, you'll notice that she says, bless you, son. Um, and they call her their spiritual mother. So they call her mama. So it's very bizarre. Buckle your seatbelts for what you're about to see. It is such an honor to serve you. I bless you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Apostle Catherine. I love you, and um, thank you so much for being a perfect example of full surrender and sacrifice of the Lord's love uh, for us, Lord, here. And I just, everything comes back to your teachings as to, like, not to let the pain, not to let the, what I see, not to let what I hear trouble me, but believe with all my heart. I just want to say that um, I've been coming here for two and a half years, and before I came to Five Hip Church, um, it was totally different, you know, I was expecting no Bible study, you know, they don't have no other programs, and I was kind of like disappointed, but then as I kept coming and I kept coming through time, God showed me that by you surrendering to God, God is saying, Maria, this is how I do, I'm doing church now through Apostle Catherine. God bless you, bless you. God bless you. I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. I honor you and I respect you so much. Thank you for changing my life. You have done amazing things. Um, my life has changed. My family's changed because of you. Thank you. This is my gift to you and I honor you. So I honor you. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> fine huh it is I and I, go ahead uh, i didn't hear one person praise god no. praise jesus or say the teachings of god through the bible no and uh i don't know if i've ever told you this or if you heard this about me but um the ministry that i was affiliated with before uh for years there were several times that they that the other leaders hijacked the service for the apostle's birthday and that they would um there would be some ministering that took place but they really would make a big chunk of the service focused on him and put him in a chair or or have him in his chair and they would make a montage video to have all these people and this still goes on today by the way this still goes on in his ministry um and even up till last year i mean i i have seen videos of this that it was during a public service in atlanta and there's balloons on the stage i mean it looks like a it looks like a kid's birthday party mm -hmm. i mean it was just a huge balloon background his name happy birthday apostle and then they're prophesying over him and doing all this now he he's not laying hands on them and and saying these things but it's still the same thing it's it's idolizing this person and a church service is not for this I mean, if we want to, I believe, I believe we should respect our pastors or our leaders and we can, it's not nothing wrong with saying something during a service. If it's, you know, we're just want to say, we want to appreciate our pastor or whatever, fine, make it. But this is a whole thing that's, that's directed to her. And this is not what a church service is made for. It's not made for her or any other leader. Church services are for believers to come together, to worship the Lord to lift up his name and to hear the word preached and taught and to be fed. And this is idolatry. Yeah. And the fact that she is allowing it to happen. Yeah. And 
I mean, only God knows her heart, but she seems to be drinking it in, you know, up there in her throne on the stage. Um, I go back to the the videos that we watched a few minutes ago, and um, I think that this is feeding that desire that she has. Uh, and again, I don't know her thoughts. I don't know her heart, but I know I've I've made this statement before. I think a lot of times the actions that come out of us are reflecting what's in our heart. Yeah. And the fact that she said nothing about this and corrected corrected this in theory, corrected this moment, um, there is that part of her, just like in all of us, that we crave and desire attention and someone to praise us and to say all these nice things about us. But we have to go back to, is this a biblical practice? Uh, what is the church service made for? Should we be doing this? Um, is this crossing boundaries into where it's worshiping her and I and idolizing her? And some of these people would probably not agree with that, but they also may not be um, genuinely evaluating their actions and their their belief towards her. Because I'll tell you, as someone who is in, in this belief system, it's very easy to get pulled into this this mindset of, oh, I need I need to please my spiritual father. I need to do these certain things in order for him to like me, or I want to be able to do these certain things so that I will be seen more or that I'll have more favor with him or her. And that's very easy for all of us to fall into because it, there is a major deception and indoctrination that goes on with this. And it's, it's this culture of honor. That is one of the biggest things about it is that you need to honor the leader. You need to be loyal to the leader. And this is part of that. And so I think that she's getting pulled into that. And it all goes back to this whole thing of, well, I want, I, I want this ability to be seen and known and recognized. And I think this is her way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very sad. We pray for her. We pray for her followers. And um, I just want to show you that Cat Crick is aware of the criticism that comes her way. And, and I don't see it as criticism of her personally. I see it as calling out um, deception in the church, which we are commanded to do. So here's a post that she made. Um, and in this, she writes, after seven years of walking in my calling, I've received a deeper revelation of the cost of, an, of the anointing. She puts that in quotes. A big part of the cost is the complete death to ego. Okay, she says, it's not fun to be misunderstood and lied about before an audience of thousands plus. This kind of thing never happened to me before I stepped into my calling of an apostle and began walking in the anointing, and it was quite startling and hurtful. When the false accusations and blatant lies began to be spoken about me, I remember thinking that God would vindicate me and make it be seen by all that the lies were indeed lies. Then Jesus reminded me that many false accusations were made about him and believed by many. And to this day, many still believe these false accusations. So she goes on comparing herself to uh, Jesus um, and, and saying that what she's going through is Christian persecution. Thoughts on this, Don? Well, I think there's a lot of projection going on here <laughs> and she's not being specific and she's really calling people that would call her to be accountable for what she's doing. She's calling us liars and she's bearing false witness about us. Now there's, there may be some people out there that are, that are bearing false witness about her and just slandering her and flat out mocking her. And they're not engaging with biblically what is going on here. That's, that's such gross error. But I can I can a hundred percent testify that I know that I have not and you have not done that. I have not said whenever I've looked into what she's done, I have looked at her teaching. I have looked. I have not mocked her appearance. I have not mocked her in because that's unfruitful. I mean, and as a woman, I told you this the other day. I know that we teach we we are to address false teachers and false prophets in a different way that there's a, there's a harshness that comes with that because of what they're doing. Um, as a woman and as a believer in Christ, I have to be very mindful of how I conduct myself. I can get sarcastic really fast and real and snarky really fast. And that was something that I was very free to do in this movement and use it as an excuse. Cause I was a prophet and well, prophets just have that way about them. And it's really unbecoming, and it's not honoring Christ to act that way. So I, I've i been very humbled, genuinely humbled by the Lord in coming out of this movement over the past several years. 
in dealing with people and realizing it's not about winning an argument. It's not about me being right. It's about how am I going to conduct myself as a woman of God and what scripture tells me and how I'm supposed to conduct myself. And I want to honor Christ in my conduct because I'm going to be accountable for that at the end of my life and how I conducted myself and how I glorified him in my testimony of him. So that's not always perfect. And, and I want and I thank God that by his spirit, he, he quickens me to repentance when I don't do that. But and when I'm reading this, I see a lot of projection. Um, I see her bearing herself as a martyr um, that, and she's deflecting. She's not addressing the legitimate problems and legitimate concerns. And so it's all just being broad blanketed in this. Well, they're just, everybody's lying about me. It's all false accusations. Well, let's be specific. What are you talking about? Because I think if you're going to make that claim, then you need to be specific in what you're saying we're lying about instead of just making these claims. And then what it's doing, it's creating this doctrine in people that do listen to her, that they'll say, oh, you know, poor Catherine or my apostle, she is so persecuted because she's an apostle. And so this people are coming after her just like they did Jesus and just like they did Paul. And she's setting herself up to where they won't question her. They'll immediately think she's very genuine and that th- there's no problem here. But there are huge problems. And if there's anybody listening, including Catherine, that, and you're not an apostle, Catherine, I'm sorry, but you're not an apostle. Um, there, there are only apostles in scripture. You're not an apostle. There are no apostles today. But I would just say this is that you need to be going back to scripture. You need to be going back to the word of God. And it is biblical to test people. It is biblical to call things into question. Um, it is it is biblical to test things. And it doesn't mean that you're being persecuted. And it doesn't mean that people are lying about you. If anything, that's bearing false witness against those who are legitimately coming with true biblical concerns and saying, hold on a second, that there's major problems here. And so when I see that, that's what I, what I, what I see. Yeah, it is troubling that she says that um, as a shepherd, I'm not called to all people, but only the sheep that God has assigned to me. My sheep hear my, she's quoting Jesus, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me, John 10, 27. So don't worry about those who will never see the truth about you. Uh, it Thank makes you. me so mad too, even the John 10, 27. That's a, that's a salvific passage. And, and, and it's ironic too, that's the very passage that God got my attention that Ryan said. That was what, like the very first thing, Doreen, because he he misquoted that verse and said, well, he said, my sheep hear me and they do what I say. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about spiritual sons and daughters listening to their spiritual fathers. And he used that very passage. And it was in that moment that that I believe that the Lord started taking the blinders off. And and I I was sitting there and I remember sitting in my seat in in that sanctuary and I went, that doesn't sound right. That does not sound right. And it was a salvation passage. <laughs> How faithful is God to ver- to use a, a false teacher twisting his own word? And she's doing the same thing. And God used that very passage to wake me, to start to wake me up out of deception. Praise the I, Lord. Just fi- I, f- I find this egregious. I think it's egregious that someone would use a passage like that to twist that and say, well, you know, these sheep aren't assigned to me, but the sheep hear my voice. So apparently whatever she says, that's, that's God speaking. And again, I mean, who's being glorified here? (laughs) Who's being glorified here? Yeah. Who's, who's getting the knee bent before them? Yeah. Sorry. I just had, no, that's perfect. Oh my goodness. It it makes makes me so mad seeing that. I'm thinking that is awful to do that. So Catherine Crick compares herself to apostle Peter in the next clip. So I'd love to get your take on this. At any point in the service, you can come to this area in the front. It, it, the, how God is moving now is how he moved through Apostle Peter. The shadow of the anointing. So come, come close to get a deeper work of God. A deeper, deeper into the anointing for a deeper work of God that may be needed. We know that when Apostle Peter would walk in the book of Acts, and Peter, and Paul and Peter, that people could just have their shadow pass over them, and they would be healed because of Jesus giving them that anointing. So this sounded, in my opinion, Don, 
in that clip we just watched that Catherine Crick was comparing herself to Peter's shadow. It sure did. And, and that would be a prime example of, in my, for in my, on my side of the argument, I would say that that is um, a prime example of them appealing to these texts to say there are apostles today. So she's doing exactly what a lot, some other the other leaders will do in this movement is that they will appeal to these certain passages, and but then they'll say, well, we don't believe we're apostles of Christ, but we still believe we operate in this type of power. Well, you can't separate the two if you're going to use that verse or those other verses that are tied to those apostles. Then you're you have to be comparing apples to apples. If you don't believe that they're apostles of Christ today, then why are you using those verses? Um, but she certainly, I mean, that's that's scary to to hear that, um, that she's basically putting what her what she perceives as her power, and she's really doing a power of suggestion is really what she's doing. Um, again, and it's almost like a, a performance yeah. in a way. Sad yeah. to say, it's a yeah, performance. It is, and and when I was watching her after watching those clips where she's you know an actress or on a reality show. Um, it, as you said, the mannerisms, in my opinion, seem the same. Yeah. And and so I know that sometimes when we call people on that title, apostle, and modern people, they they snap back. Well, apostle can mean missionary. And C Catherine Crick calls herself having a traveling ministry. Yeah, I've heard that argument too. Um, I've heard other leaders say, well, I don't mean I'm a, a big A apostle. I'm a church planter or slash missionary. But again, I, I would just look at, uh, just like you can look at a website of a church and you can see, well, their doctrinal statements look sound, but their actions don't line up with what they say mm -hmm. in print that they believe. And so with her, just like with others that say this, um, and I'm by no means an expert, I've simply just gone on and, and done my homework. And then I've observed almost 20 years of spending time in this movement of the word of faith and NAR. And I can, I can pick up on a lot of the red flags in this. And so, and a lot of the, the mannerisms, a lot of the language that's going on, a lot of the practices. And I've seen some of these people that they call themselves apostles. Well, I don't believe an apostle of Christ. And, you know, I, I'm just a church planter. But when you talk to these people and you read their books and you, and you really pay attention to what they're saying, they, they don't believe that. No, they, they don't believe and, they're apostles that big A apostles with governing authority. That's the key, isn't it? You don't see church yeah. planters and missionaries saying, hey, you can't do this. Only I can do it. Yeah. And then why get so fixated if you're just a church planter, then just then don't use the word apostle right. because it's causing confusion. It's causing great confusion. And again, if you're not taking the time and I was someone who was biblically illiterate um, and I'm not perfect by any means. Now, I'm still learning and growing in my understanding of Scripture, but I am more literate now than I was five years ago um, when it was horrible. I mean, it was by the grace of God that I recognized I was under some false teaching and just starting to ask questions, but, still, but fearful because I thought, this Bible verse that this leader I'm under is mentioning, something's wrong, but I don't quite know what it is. I just know something's wrong. Um, and, and fearful to ask questions because I just didn't know enough. And knowing what I know now, um, I, I can't stress that enough to people is that you've got to know what the word of God says. And just because someone calls himself an apostle, again, I think that that brings great confusion. If you don't know what apostle means and, and the, the value of that and the weight of that in scripture, then you're gonna get greatly confused when someone calls himself an apostle. If you're just a church planter or missionary, then, why not just say that instead of using that term? But this term means something to them because they view it as power and authority and that the church needs those apostles and prophets. And if you don't believe me, you can go look at what some of these people are saying. Even currently, I've seen some of them saying, you've got to have apostles and prophets. They're speaking to pastors and teachers. And if you don't have these things, then you're going to miss the next move of God. Well, that's more than a church planter or missionary, in my opinion. Um, and and just with pers and personally um, dealing with someone who believed themselves to be an apostle, it goes beyond that. It really does. It, it, Dawn, it reminds me of hypnosis, which was the world I was in. 
um, as a new ager, I was a certified hypnotherapist, certified past life regressionist, and and then also a neuro linguistic programming, which is what Tony Robbins teaches. And and so that power suggestion that if you come toward the stage, uh, the demons will start to rattle. They'll start to be affected by the. I mean, I guess she means her anointing. Is that what she's her special she, anointing? Yep. Yeah, and she's even written a book about it about her. Oh, anointing. she did. That's and true. she has ministered at her church from her book rather than the Bible. I've seen oh. that as well. She has ministered from her book about the secret of the anointing, which again, that's a, that's a Gnostic title. You're implying that the Bible is not enough, but your book is necessary. And she's even told people that you will receive the anointing through the pages of her book. Oh, that's boy. Gnosticism. It and is, that's, and it's, that's heretical. It is. It, it's also, it reminds me of Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy saying, you need my science and health key to the scripture. Uh, Joseph um, Smith saying oh. you need this Book of Mormon. So all these false prophets would always point to their own work and their own book right. and not point to the Bible as being sufficient. Yeah. And and again, that's the concern that I, that I have with her. Um, and I say that again, not in a mocking way um, or wanting to even, and to be slanderous, it's simply observing the fact that yeah. This is very similar to some of these patterns. And my concern, uh, my concern is certainly for her and also too, but the many masses of people that listen to her because th there's great deception going on here. And, and this is an eternal matter that right. we need to have great concern over and, and brokenness over and praying that she would repent and that people that follow her would repent. Um, and God is gracious and merciful and um, I wouldn't want anything less than what God did for me. I mean, right. that would be very selfish of me to, to, to want to see her condemned or to see her um, eternally separated from God. But, I, you know, both of us are saying this with great love and concern. Yeah, we're from, we're, we're from the Been There, Done That Club. Yeah. We're, the, we're your older sister, Scout, if you're watching this. I, I declare every generational curse broken off your life now. In Jesus' name, I break every curse that was sent upon your body, and I detach you from what you've renounced. I declare every spirit attached, all infirmity that's causing these problems in your body, every spirit that's keep, making you to gain weight, I declare all must go now. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Complete freedom in Jesus' name. God has freed you on. God has set you free. Hallelujah! 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 It just seems like power suggestion going on. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then it's so sad because I think that there are people that are legitimately dealing with things. They're dealing with sicknesses or they're dealing with uh, depression or they're dealing with anxieties and real life problems. And they're looking to this woman to set them free. And again, the, the focus is off. Um, she, who is the savior? Who is the deliverer? It's Jesus Christ. And then what happens when these people leave? There, there is so much adrenaline um, that can be in these atmospheres because, and you, and a pa again, power of suggestion. You've seen people go up on stage before. What do they do? Well, they manifest and they fall on the floor and they're screaming and writhing and crying. And some of that could certainly be demonic, um, the, a demonic spectacle. So I think some of it is also um, performance or peer pressure. Maybe they, some people fall prey to the peer pressure because they believe all oh, this man or woman of God is in front of me. And so I need to do what others have done um, or fall down. And um, it's just so sad because I think, well, okay, if this person feels good in that moment, what happens when they go home? Their problems are still there. Mm -hmm. Like this is not fixing anything. This is, and, and the people are not even being directed towards Christ. Right. Christ for the sufficiency, when Christ in my weakness, Christ in my sickness, Christ in my suffering, they're directed to her. They're directed yeah. to her for their solutions. And again, that's not a biblical approach at all. The pushback we get, of course, is that Jesus gave authority to the disciples. And then there was that one man in Luke who was not a disciple to cast out demons. And therefore, Catherine Crick is saying, in Jesus' name, 
And so she's doing exactly what was done in the Gospels. And that's what we hear from people to justify this kind of practice. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing when I tell people that I've had that pushback too, um, is that we need to look at the context of scripture um, and to see who Jesus was talking to, the audience he was talking to, who he gave the commands to. And it, do we see this in the, in the future epistles, the, the following mm-hmm. epistles, that this was instructed to the churches to do this? We don't. And then we have to go back to the whole argument um, in deliverance ministry. They're not doing this to unbelievers. They are t- they're telling people deliverance is for believers only, for Christians. And then that, that gets into a whole other realm of, well, do you really believe that the gospel is sufficient to, to deliver someone? Do you really believe that it's powerful enough, that the Holy Spirit is powerful enough to deliver someone today by the proclamation of the gospel? And, and this is not a pattern or an instruction that we see from Paul to cast demons out of believers. And so I would argue that by saying this type of teaching is needed today, you're saying that the scriptures are not sufficient Mm -hmm. to tell us how to be delivered. When we know that deliverance, Doreen, is is, salvation is deliverance. That's right. Um, And and it's powerful enough to set us free. And we uh, we are no longer under the, praise God, we're no longer under the tyranny of Satan. Right. I mean, that, that is freedom to know that. And these people need to know that. But they're, mm-hmm. they're being told, in my opinion, they're being told, you're still under the tyranny of Satan. That's, yep. And that's not good news. Yeah, that's not the gospel. No, it's not. I mean, Ephesians 6, of course, outlines that there is spiritual warfare for believers. Sure. But nowhere, even in, in the gospels, when Jesus is casting out demons, there's no one who, who is a saved believer in Jesus who had a demon inside of them. It's impossible because once you're saved, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Right. And we can't you're have sealed. Demons. You're I know sealed. <laughs> some of them say that you get the demons at the tip of your toes and fingers, which is exactly what I used to teach in the new age, by the way, in the spirit releasement world. Um, but it's so only unsaved people can be possessed. Yes, exactly. And and I and I would argue too, you know, when you see in the, the gospels, um, when you even you do the study on this, and um, the, even that Greek word that's used, diamonizomai, it's used 13 times in the Gospels. That's the only place that's, that it's used. And every account that you see this, um, it, it, it looks very much like what's going on in these modern deliverance movements. Yeah. And those people were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They were not born again. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it looks very similar to that, and, and their argument does not stand up. But then, as you know, they'll play semantics with the words, well, we don't believe that a Christian can be possessed, but we believe that they can have indwelling demons and they Same compartmentalize. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that really alludes back to the word of faith because of the trichotomous uh, belief of spirit, soul, and body. And so the, I think that that's how they get around it. But mm. that, that's just my thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's Acts 19, where Demetrius, the silversmith, was upset with Paul for sharing the gospel. So no one was buying his Artemis silver statues. And so I think he was really mad at Paul for stopping on his business model. And I I see this today with people who make a lot of money doing unbiblical things. They do not want to hear that what they're doing is unbiblical because it could threaten their business. That's a great point. Because spiritual warfare and, and deliverance is a lucrative it's a lucrative thing because it draws the crowds. It draws people in. Yeah. This gentleman here. Hallelujah. God is saying. Oh, this you is free awful. Right now. Oh, this is awful. Thank you, yep. Lord. Is there anything you wanted to renounce? I want to renounce a generational curse. My child is autistic and he's 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 not he's, he has no brains at all. Like we've tried everything. And um, I've gone through deliverance before, and it's just so hard to break this curse. So I was hoping you can also pray for my child. He's in the crowd. Yes. God is breaking this generational curse right now. Thank you, Jesus. His power is here right now. It is time now for your deliverance and your family's deliverance. I break every generational curse off of you off of this whole family and i detach this family and you from what you spoke i declare every spirit attached every spirit of 
of witchcraft, every spirit of mental illness. I declare on three, all must leave him in Jesus' name. One, two, three. Free. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. His power is enough. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I declare to your son, I declare freedom to him. Now the generational curse is broken. Now in Jesus' name. This is mom here too. Thank you, Jesus. Can you come to the front right here? I declare creative miracles in his mind now, in Jesus' name. I speak healing to his mind now. Where there was nothing, let there be everything now in his mind that, he, that, that, he sh that God intended him to have now in Jesus' name. And I speak peace to this family, abundant life to this family. I release this anointing upon him now. And I speak peace, abundant life to fill him now in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Deeply concerning. Watching her doing that with this father of an autistic child. And then to the autistic child. And and basically making false hope promises. Yeah. And it, it really, it angers me. I've had some people reach out uh, when I've addressed some of this with the teaching that autism is a, a, a demon. And there are people that have autism and um, God is using that for his glory in their life with, to, to draw them closer to him and in different ways. And it's really diminishing the um, there's several things going on here during it. Make me, it just makes me angry because yeah. she's she's demon. It's, it's putting this this belief into practice that anybody with autism has a demon automatically. And then why is he acting that way? He's not the one, if, they, if they're going to hold to this, why is he acting that way? Because of the, she's saying there's a generational curse, which I know we've talked about that before, but even if you read in scripture and you go to Ezekiel 18, um, we are not responsible for the sins of our ancestors. We are responsible for our individual sin. Now, it doesn't mean autism is a sin. I'm not saying that. But if you're going to use their teaching, we have to go back to that. I do not believe there are generational curses as far as what they're saying. They believe that demons can attach themselves to bloodlines and families and that they can work them way, work their way down through families, which that's that's not even what the verses are talking about as far as it going to the third and fourth generation in Exodus 20. That's addressing sin um, and idolatry that's going on. But it, it's a really sad and angering situation because it's it's a false teaching of generational curses, um, it's demonizing that that child, um, and um, false hope. As as of what you said, um, God could certainly um, re re heal someone that had different illnesses or had autism or, or things like that. But if He doesn't, that doesn't change who He is, and that He can still use these things for His glory to draw that person closer to himself or whatever, to sanctify that person further, whatever's going on, it's wrong to demonize th these types of situations. And it's, um, it, it, it's just, it's just really sad. It's, it's very sad. And then if you heard him at the beginning, he said, well, I've had deliverance done before, but this is a really strong thing. This is, it's, this is where the error comes in. It's if you had deliverance done, then Jesus is enough to deliver. We, there's no need for all of this. So that should bring the questions to your mind. Is this a biblical practice? And I would say, no, this is not a biblical practice. This is all this is doing is leading to further spiritual bondage. And it's not bringing someone closer to Christ. Again, it's pointing to her. It's pointing to her power and her authority that she's telling people she has when she doesn't. It's so sad. It, it, it reminds me of in Christian science and word of faith, it's it, you, you blame the person if they don't get well right away. Yep. And yep. you didn't have enough faith. That's the whole problem. Or in yep. Christian science, you had a negative thought. That's why you're sick. Yep. And, and that's not it at all. As you said, in, in second Corinthians one, nine says this, that, that God gives us trials so that we will learn to lean on him and not ourselves to draw yep. us closer to him. 
so sometimes it's not God's will for us to be healed. And she's, and many of these word of faith teachers say that it's always God's will to heal when it, how can they say that? Yeah. And she's even pointing back at notice at the end, what she said, it's not that we need a, um, a, a revitalization of the deliverance ministry. We need, we need the anointing back. So she's, she believes that the anointing has been lost and that she has the anointing. So again, she has something special. She has the power. She has the answers, everybody. She has the answers. So you just need to go to her serve. I'm sorry, but this is what this is, is this is man or woman exaltation. This is not honoring Christ. And she needs to minister the gospel. You know, just praise God. Well, how about you minister the gospel? This is not the gospel. These people are leaving more bound than what they were in in these false teachings. Sorry. It's I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This yeah. Because of my affiliations with this, I, there's there's this. I'm passionate about saying something about this because it's so destructive. Yeah, it is absolutely destructive. There are people walking away from God, and it, you know the question is, did they even know Him to begin with? But there are people walking away from the profession of faith because of things like this. Mm-hmm. And they think, well, God doesn't love me. You know, I've done something wrong. I haven't broken enough generational curses off. I've d-. And they're, it's myth. It's, it's all this mythological teaching that's ultimately pointing back to Catherine Crick or whoever's standing up there. And it's not honoring Christ. Look to Christ. Yes. Even if he doesn't heal you, look to him. Because these are temporal things we're dealing with. This is a light momentary affliction. And we are to look to him um, for our hope and our joy and our encouragement, not to these people. Amen. So true. Don, I want to thank you so much for your time. And in the description below, I've got resources, including Don's Love Sick Scribe podcast and blogs. And also a support group that Don Hill and our good friend and sister in Christ, Emily Massey, they run a support group called Snatch from the Flames. That's from the book of Jude uh, for women who have come out of this kind of deception, including New Age. And I'll put that in the link below. And I also want to give a shout out to our brother in Christ, Jake Elliott, who helped us with gathering clips for this episode and encouraging us. Thank you, Jake, and the and his links are in the description below. And also, Redeemed in Christ, uh, one of the um, clips that we got here, and some other clips. I there we give we believe in giving full credit where credit is due, so it's all in the links below. So, Don, thank you again for your time today. Uh, you always uh, just share from your heart so beautifully, um, and you can just tell you have such a heart for the lost. So, thank you. Thanks for having me on, Doreen. God bless.